send you a list of, uh, you can collect yourself the alphabetical order of the list of individuals in the classroom for your last, based on the last names. And then you choose the case reports starting from whatever the number from the beginning and choose two case reports per individual. Okay. So you have, okay, you can open the page and what's the first case? we were in the founder effect, I think we talked about when a population breaks off from a small area and then uh, settles, settles somewhere else or whatever the case may be, then what happens is that the gene frequencies may not be similar to the larger population because the founder is the one who determines that small sector of the population will be lower than the population. For example, in one of these lakes of Venezuela, hunting the high incident, in fact, I told you before, that the fellow who mapped this gene actually had to travel a lot because people were moving around with the boats as well. So, therefore, this is called a founder effect. One of the syndromes, Ellis Van Tevall syndrome, I've got a stunted fingers as well as the extra digits here. This is one of them which has been documented very well for the founder effect. There are also other incidences, such as in French Canadians, type 1 tyrosinemia. And also, there is, uh, this particular thing is very high incidence in a different region in Quebec, for example, okay? So this is one of the enzyme deficiencies in the degenerative pathway of tyrosine that is also, and they noted that as a founder effect. Other things like the uh, X-linked uh, uh, choreodermia, you know, in the Finland area, which is pretty remarkably located in this one particular area here. So these are all the examples of founder effects. And now let us talk about another concept called heterozygous advantage. Heterozygotes which have increased fitness, even 
even though the mutant homozygous is, is a different fitness, heterozygous will have a better fitness. That is, F will be closer to uh, closer to one or better than the, 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 the zero, obviously. And why is it that increased fitness is there? I mean, the reasons obviously are not clear, but nevertheless, there is a clear observation. That, for example, particularly in a sickle cell allele, see that is a normal allele, that is a sickle cell allele. And this is a heterozygous. Whereas, if you, if you go according to the Hardy Weinberg uh, equilibrium, the frequencies are different from observed frequencies. So that means there is obviously heterozygous, which is supposed to be following the 2 PQ laws, are 2672, but whereas here 2993. Slightly better. So uh, people are thinking, therefore, the selection, usually the selection operates in the homozygous. But here, selection also not only <coughs> on the mutant allele, but as well as the heterozygous allele. So, therefore, the changes in selection may change the relevant frequency of the sickle cell disease. For example, in African Americans, it is already declining compared to the natives. That is because of migration and introduction of new gene pools. It is not only the sickle cell advantage, but what is these other things like HBC, hemoglobin C, thalassemias, g 6 pd deficiency, and a Duffy blood group, and a wide variety of other uh, disorders, and heterozygotes for those disorders, are also having advantage, particularly as a malarial resistance. This is what the causal relationship that they observe. That doesn't mean that this is a causative or related uh, phenotype. So there are also other disorders like Tay-Sachs and cystic fibrosis, they also, they think that these may also have a heterozygous advantage purely because they are prevalent only in white population. Okay. Therefore, they think that these disorders also, the alleles for those disorders in a heterozygous status has some kind of an advantage for the fitness selection and therefore heterozygous advantage has been noted in multiple disorders for sickle cell and a wide variety of other disorders. So I'm sure that you must remember at least the sickle cell even though you may not worry about cystic fibrosis and that sort of thing. But in Iceland, we already talked about the CCR5 deletion of the HIV infection, which is a receptor, chemokine receptor, which is for HIV infection. If there is a deletion, obviously, they have got a resistance for the HIV infection. So, but in Iceland, there is a tremendous amount of CCR5 deletion alleles present in the population. That could be due to the genetic drift. But in this case, selection is not going to increase the frequency of AIDS pandemic. That is because it is, AIDS pandemic is actually very, very recent. And therefore, you cannot get that selection kind of an uh, fixed in the population. So another infectious disease may have increased the frequency just like malaria, and possibly due to the heterozygous advantage, that is the AIDS, that is what they are thinking about, but still, we don't know whether this is true or not at this point. So that finishes that chapter on polymorphisms and a wide variety of other uh, things that we talked about in this chapter. Now we use these polymorphisms to map a gene. That's what the next chapter will be. Why do you have to map a gene? I mean, Frank Riddle at Yale had answered this question a long time ago in 1960s and 70s. Just because it is there, I want to map a gene. That's not the right answer, but that's what he told when people asked a long time But now people map the gene usually for disease gene identification. Now the human genome is there, therefore the concept will slightly shift. But I have to tell you how the mapping of the gene proceeded in the earlier days, and now what is the current status of the gene mapping. So, if you want to map a gene in Drosophila or zebrafish or something else, it's relatively easy <coughs> because you've got a heterozygous two populations, 
you can breathe them, you can get homozygous, you can get the same Mendelian ratio of 1 is to 2 is to 1. Then you can go back and look at those population of homozygous and see whether there is any recombination. This is what Dr. Morgan defined a long time ago. And utilizing that recombination frequency, you can actually tell whether the mutation is linked to the phenotype, how far it is apart. And then you can go ahead and clone the gene. That is how in lower organisms, not earlier organisms, I don't want to use lower word, in earlier organisms, this is what people have been doing for mapping studies. I'm sure Drosophila genetics, you have done a little bit in your biology course. <coughs> so mapping in humans is not trivial. The basic reason is the following. See, in, in Drosophila, you can get thousands of meiotic events, right? Because you just collect one zygote, one embryo. That is a result of each chromosome is coming from one parent or the other. Therefore, you get tremendous amount of meiosis. You can score all meiotic events. Whereas in humans, that is not the case. You only have family members. You may have a family of five. So it's only five members. Out of that, you may not have a recombinant at all. So that is the reason why family studies are limiting, and therefore some new methods. You cannot study thousands of meiosis in humans. If you have a family of 3,000 members, <laughs> yes, it is very easy to map the gene. But because of that lack of luxury, human genome mapping has been only for specialists, and those who have mastered the mapping methods, and that's what we're going to go through slide by slide. But before going into the details, let me, obviously, you know the recombination in myosis, but let me review you a little bit. As you see, it's a male and a female, you just a pair of chromosomes represented here. What happens during meiosis is there's a shuffling or recombination between homologous pairs, the chromosomes happen, and therefore exchange of genetic material between the two chromosomes. This is the recombination process. In this one, you've got another, another individual, you may have a different type, because each time it's a different meiosis. So you will have a different kind of uh, 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 recombination, and another individual will have an entirely different kind of recombination. So in a third generation, you can again have an exchange between these two, and thus you will have a chromosome with all sorts of shuffling things. So that is, shuffling of genes happen during meiotic exchange processes. But obviously, this shuffling, if it continues, a lot of regions are being shuffled. But there may be some units here which are constantly traveling all through that. For example, that black area is that black area is conserved in even those other exchanges happen. So that means there are packets on the chromosome which travel together irrespective of how many generations of recombinations have happened. That is the principle that we're going to exploit in human gene now. So you also know that the alleles at loci are different chromosomes are not independent in a gene law. Let us take two loci. Here is one locus, that is the DD, and that is the MF, both of the alleles. If you take a look at, let us assume that this D and that M, these are the two pairs of chromosomes here. This D and M are paternally derived chromosomes. Whereas this D and that M are maternally derived chromosomes. Now let us go through how these meios meiotic recombination and homologous pairs will line up. If it lines up like this, that is this particular thing on the left side and that is on the right side, you are going to get this kind of a gamut. That is, this capital D and M will follow as one progeny. And this would be, small d and m will be that time. That means the paternal things have gone to one side and the maternal things have gone to the other side. Okay? In the division. So that is called parental recombination, parental combinations. Whereas in the other, other case, you know, if, if you, that, that doesn't follow that way, you can get capital D and a small m paired together and a small d capital M pair together, those are called non-parental combinations. So your assumption is that you're going to follow these paternal and maternal things, 
and you got parental combinations and non-parental combinations here. But if you take a look at this number, the parental combinations are exactly equivalent to the non-parental combinations. That is always one to one. But let us also take an example where there is a crossover between two loci. If there is a recombination between two loci, if there is a crossover right there between these chromatids here, you are going to get parental and non-parental combinations that we talked about before, and that would be non-parental and parental <coughs> combinations. The form would be 2 is to 2 that is equal to 1 is to 1. Okay. Now, let us have put two crosses here, one cross over there and one cross over there. If you align these guys, you are going to get all sorts of possibilities here. But if you sum up all these combinations, you are going to get again 8 is to 1, that is still 1 is to 1. That is, irrespective of number of crossovers in a given chromosome, or between two loci, you still are going to get the non-parental and the parental combinations will be essentially 1 is to 1. Okay? That means these are random events of recombination, and these loci are farther apart. But if it were to be closer, let us say that the D and the M are extremely close, then you are going to disturb this ratio. This ratio won't be one is to one. Okay? Then this is this is an example. Here is here are some chromosomes here shown. These are the recombinants. This is an exchange of material that is, is shared differently. So these are recombinant and these are non-recombinant. So, okay. so when you take these two kinds, this is non-recombinant recombinant ratio is going to be equal. That means these two loci are farther apart. Whereas if the loci are close, very close together, they are tightly linked, then you are going to get only non-recombinant, nothing else. Whereas when you take these loci a little bit farther apart, not that closely tightly linked, then what you're going to get is the non-recombinant to recombinant ratio will be upset. So non-recombinants will be more. See, for example, in this case, these three are non-recombinants, and that is a recombinant. There's a small shade, slightly different, okay? So you have non-recombinant will be greater in number than the recombinants. So depending upon the the ratio of the recombinant and non-recombinants in a given population, a human population, you can tell how much of recombination has occurred. Okay? That means you have to observe these loci somehow, I mean there, there are methods to do that, and look at their disease phenotype, which is, let us say disease is one locus, and the other locus is a polymorphic marker any polymorphic marker, doesn't matter what it is. If you have those two, and when you are always talking, let us say you are analyzing six members in a family. Out of six members in a family, there is one polymorphism which is always present with the disease. So you know that these are no recombination, and therefore you can tell that these two loci, the disease locus and the polymorphic locus, are traveling together. Whereas, if you, have, if you have three or four families, and let us say you find, instead of six out of six recombinations or something, you may find five recombinants. So that means the recombinant frequency is still, you know, higher than the non-recombinant frequency, and therefore they are farther apart. So the, the, the close of the genes, the recombination frequency would be, what, higher or lower? Lower. Lower, okay? So that is the principle here that people use for human genetics. It's the same principle in Drosophila and other things, except the number of meiotic events are going to be limited here in human you know, analysis. But there's also one more called phase, phase of these alleles. Alleles on the same chromosome are called coupling or in cis phase. Alleles on different chromosomes are called in repulsion or a trans phase. The knowledge of this phase, that is whether it is cis or trans, is extremely important 
because if you have the information about the systolic coupling or repulsion, if it is in a coupling situation, it is easier to map the gene. That is, it will be more informative if the phase is known. What does that mean? Let us say that these two, D and M, these two loci are considered to be in couple. Whereas this D and M are considered to be in repulsion. This is in repulsion, that is in repulsion, that is coupling. That means this is in cis phase and that is in a trans phase. Okay. So when you are having an inheritance pattern that you are looking at, if you know in a parental type, this is the one which is in cis configuration. That means when you observe in the next generation, also in this configuration, that these two are in coupling, that means they are closer together. Okay? So it is easy to follow the coupling and repulsion in human genetics. Okay? Let us take this classical example of a retinal, uh, retinitis pigmentosa mutation. This is the RP9. So you have a locus 2, that is the B, and the locus A, is the, there are two of them. But look at this. This fellow is having the disorder. Sorry, this is not a fellow. This, 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 this girl is having the disorder. A woman is having the disorder. So you have a locus to the B. And now you have this progeny. Okay. So if you take a look at this, the B and capital B and D, wherever there is a capital B and D, you have the disorder. But when you have a small B and a D, you don't have the disorder. Whereas, look at the pattern of locus 1 with respect to the D. That is, AD has no, no problem at all. There's absolutely no relevance. Whether it is small A capital D or a big A capital small D or whatever, you have no relationship between the disease versus this. So that is immediately telling us that these two genes are probably linked together. That is a common sense is telling us. Okay? It's not a big deal. So now let us take a look at what is the recombination frequency and what is the map distance. Classically, as you know that the 3 billion base pairs are there in human genome, right? 1 million base pairs, that is 1 times 10 to the 6 base pairs, that is 1,000 kilobases, is called a centimorgan, named after the individual Dr. Morgan, who is the father of genetics, in particularly the Trisophila genetics, okay? And Morgan trained another fellow called Stuttiman. Both of them published classical papers. That is where first mapping really occurred. So the so-called genetic mapping was done by Dr. Morgan and Stuttiman. Okay? If you go to Columbia University, there is a room number, what, 216 or something like that. That is the famous room in Columbia where the Trisophila genetics started a long time ago. So if you, if you take a map distance, that means 3 billion base pairs, you want, how much is that? That is, 1 million is equal to 1 centimorgan. So you must have at least several thousand, couple of 3,000, 4,000 centimorgan should be there. So therefore, 10 centimorgans means 10 million base pairs. 20 centimorgans means 20 million. So this is the map distance between those sides. But that is also, if you plot the recombination frequency and the map distance, the smaller the recombination frequency, the lower the recombination frequency, that means they are very close to each other. So if you take 20 map, 20 centimorgans from here to there, and if you go up the that point, you've got a point 0.15 is the recombination frequency. There is a theta is the recombination frequency. So 0.15, that means if it is, if it is 0.1 is equal to approximately 10 centimorgans, it should be 0.2 for 20 centimorgans, correct? But unfortunately, the recombination frequency and the map distances do not match perfectly. They go hand in hand, but not like a hand in glove, just very close by. For example, this is just, that's what I just now told you. That is the theta. Same distance is measured. So this is di 
different kind of a unit and for short distances it makes perfect sense, but for long distances it's not going to be exactly equivalent. If it were to be less than 10 centimorgans, sure, it matches essentially one to one. Okay? But if it goes beyond 20 centimorgans or a little bit larger, the recombination frequency or the recombination fraction is not going to be one to one correspondence. That is the reason why. If you take only the map distances and the genome size, you've got a length of 3,615 centimorgans. That is the genetic distance. But you have only 3,200 megabase. That is the genome size. That is 3 billion base pairs. So therefore, it is roughly one centimorgan is one megabase or one million base pairs. But there is a discrepancy in these numbers not one-to-one -one exactly. Right? But in fact, if you go to gender, there is a much greater difference. If you take a female and a male, because male meiosis is different from female meiosis. We talked about the differences before. So for whatever reason, if you take the distance of the same human genome, it is 4,460 centimorgans in a female compared to 2,590 in a male. Okay. So what we saw before is the 3,000 something is an average between the two, male and the female. Okay, but if you take independent genders, there is going to be a quite dramatic difference. That means for every megabase that you are looking at, there is going to be more centimorgans depicted in a genetic distance in a female compared to a less genetic distance in a male. Okay. <clears throat> So now let us talk about concept of linkage equilibrium and linkage disequilibrium. We just grossly told that these two genes, if they are close together, they will have no recombination or less recombination, and therefore they are going to be passed on from one generation to another as a packet, okay, as a box. But if you measure the allele frequencies and the haplotype frequencies, okay, then we're going to talk about linkage equilibrium and disequilibrium. Let us take an example here. These are two loci. This is an allele A and allele small a, that is a D allele and a small D allele. So the percentages of allele frequencies are, that is 50% of the population, this is about 10, that is about 90, but that is about 50, 50. So you've got these two alleles, 50, 50 percent. But whereas if you take a look at the haplotype, haplotype is both alleles put together, right? That is in, in, in line, you should draw that is a haplotype. So if you take this DA, that is a haplotype frequency. Now, if you consider the DA as a haplotype frequency, in a population, that is only 5 percent. Whereas if you take the capital D and a small a, that is, by the combination, there's a different haplotype, you got that 5%. Okay. So if you, if you take DA, this is 45 and 45%. Now let us take a, a, a look at the uh, frequency of the D alleles present in this haplotype. That is 5%. That is frequency of the D present in that haplotype is 5%. So if you add up these two percentages of these haplotypes, it is going to be equivalent 10% that is present in DLA. That's obviously matching with that. And same thing here. This is 45 and 45. And that is considered that these two haplotypes and the number of alleles that are present are in linkage equilibrium. That is, if you add up this 5 and 45, for example, particularly for a A allele, this is for A allele, for A allele that is 5%, this is 45%. So if you add these two up, that becomes 50, right? And that 50 is represented there. So that is called a linkage equilibrium. You get it? So if you, if you go to a different kind of cal calculation, let us take that DA is 0%, but this time it is 10% here. With respect to this, it is obviously total is 10 percent. That is not a big deal. Whereas D D put together is 10 percent, equivalent to that. 
But whereas if you put 0% and 50%, that is also equivalent to 50%. But look at the kind of disparity here. This is not equal, that is not equal. That is why it is called complete disequilibrium. Okay. That is, these percentages completely vary. They are not equal. They are in a disequilibrium. Okay. Whereas, if you take, instead of 0%, if there is 1%, and that would be 9, it would be 49 and 41, this is called partial linkage disequilibrium. Okay. So, what is linkage disequilibrium conceptually? This is all nice percentages. Let us take a mutation. 